So in quantum economics, money plays a role rather like energy. What happens when we get an awful lot of energy together in the same place? Well, in 1945, the Trinity test convincingly demonstrated that quantum forces do scale up. Since then, we've learned to exploit the energy inside the atom in different ways, from peaceful nuclear reactors to, more recently, quantum computing. Now, money is a quantum social technology with quantum properties that also scale up to affect the economy as a whole. Perhaps the key idea in physics is energy. And the Trinity test re released some 92 terajoules of energy, which is about the same as 20 tank cars full of oil. And there's also energy in finance. As an example, uh, this house up the road, it's an empty house um, close to where I live, and it's sold for uh, 2.24 million Canadian dollars, which is a lot of money. It's about 170 times the global median income. And we, we can equate that with energy. So one way to do it is to do a thermodynamic analysis of the world economy and figure out how much energy is needed to maintain a dollar bill. Another way is to simply to figure out how much oil it would buy. And actually, either method gives roughly similar results, which is that about 40 tank cars of oil or two Trinity tests. So that's a lot of energy. So where does this energy come from? Well, most money is created by, not by central banks, but by private banks lending money for things like mortgages on houses. So it must come from there somewhere. Um, as the deputy governor of the Bank of Norway uh, explained in a 2017 speech, when you borrow from a bank, the bank just credits your bank account, uh, the bank does not transfer the money from somewhere, someone else, or from a vault or anything. It's uh, simply created by the bank itself out of nothing. And we've already seen this process So, um, for a medieval tally stick. So now instead of a sovereign with a divine right of kings, we have your local bank making a loan to someone who wants to buy a house. And there's the loan. And the output, instead of a tally stick, is going to be some kind of money. And this is associated with energy through this equation here, which involves a 1 over P uh, represents the coercion. So this is ultimately where the energy is coming from. Now in physics, Bohr's principle of correspondence states that at large enough scales, quantum mechanics should converge to classical. But things like uh, nuclear devices don't wash out. And Quantum properties uh, have been scaled up by design through technologies such as computer chips, lasers, superconductors, and so on, which make up much of our economy today. This picture shows Enrico Fermi overseeing the first controlled self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction in 1942. The reaction is self-sustaining, he announced quietly, happy, happily. The curve is exponential. And we get the same kind of self-sustaining exponential growth in the economy. Banks make loans on real estate. This adds to money supply. It's used to buy more real estate and so on. So you, got, you find that the growth in house prices, in, in Canada at least, uh, matches quite closely the growth in the money supply. They both grow together. And the system needs to grow continuously in order to pay the interest on the debt. It's ironic that Aristotle thought that money was sterile and should not breed, as he put it, by handing out interest, but we ended up with what amounts to a financial breeder reactor. And the product of all this is asset price inflation and inequality. On top of all this debt is a uh, system of derivatives, which has an estimated notional value of some one quadrillion dollars, described by Warren Buffett once as potential weapons of mass destruction. And this quadrillion dollars is really a kind of a magical number because it's larger than the actual economy. So how do macroeconomists model the financial sector, which is so huge? Well, really, they don't. As the European Central Bank uh, pointed out in a, in a speech, 
uh, and the prevalent macro models during the financial crisis of 2007 and 8, the financial sector was absent, considered to have a remote effect. And since then, there have been efforts to incorporate financial frictions into these models, even if it's not thought that they were played too big a role. But when you think about a finance, this is you know this is odd because finance is really the the opposite of friction. I mean, when you think about something like the financial crisis, you see these price changes. Uh, they the situation was described by one layman's employee as like a massive earthquake, and the comparison was quite accurate in some ways. This is a plot of tremors in the ground during an actual massive earthquake, which looks quite similar, part of course from the the time scale. So these concerns about the financial system are not exactly new. One person to raise them uh, was Frederick Soddy, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1921, but switched to economics because of his fear that a financial crash would lead to nuclear conflict, as eventually did happen with the Great Depression, being followed by the rise of the Nazi parties in World War II. And Soddy described money in the financial system as a whole as a virtual wealth that gives the illusion of being unbound by earthly constraints. He saw orthodox economics as, as just justifying this debt system. He believed that we had to align human law and convention with the needs of thermodynamics. And uh, his solution to all these problems was basically to stop paying tax um, in order to make a clean sweep of all the webs woven to entangle humanity by the magicians who have discovered how to get something out of nothing and moreover to make it bear perennial interest. So. I'm not sure that strategy would really work today, but um, the split between the virtual and the real, which he highlighted, was very evident in uh, 2020, the spring of 2020, when we had two headlines at the same time. U.S. stocks have their best month since 1987. The U.S. now has 22 million unemployed. And this um, real virtual split in money is perhaps uh, most evident in, in our attitude towards the environment. Uh, mainstream economics kind of treats planet as, the planet as an inert object. Environmental damage is a market failure, even though markets are optimizing the numbers by, by growing as fast as they can. So I think one of the main contributions of the quantum approach is to draw our attention to this dual real virtual nature of money and uh, get us to align our economy with uh, and, and the use of energy uh, with the thermodynamic realities of the planet.